Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, which is the European Legislative Framework for Advertising Claims. Um, this webinar will be recorded, um, so don't worry if you um, haven't been able to attend live or if you need to dip out for any reason, or if you'd like to share at the end, I will be sending everyone a link um, who has registered to this event at the end of the event. Um, there's also going to be a Q&A at the end, um, so if you've got any questions as we go through, please feel free to make a note of them um, because we'll open these up to questions um, yeah, at the end. Um, I've got Sue, um, who's going to be joining me today as well, um, and who's going to give a brief introduction to our um, presentation today. Um, Sue, are you able to um, speak? Yep, can you hear me okay? Perfect, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Good. I do want, just want everybody to know that I've just had a little notification up to, uh, on my screen that says that my internet connection is unstable, so uh, hopefully things will be okay. So thank you very much, uh, everybody, for joining us today. It's hugely appreciated. Uh, we really enjoy disseminating all of the information about our business and the way that the wind's blowing and the way that trade's going, uh, no more so than during a crisis like we're in at the moment. Uh, we're pleased to say that we're open for business. Everything's um, uh, as exactly as it should be, really. Uh, some of our customers are finding it a little bit difficult to get raw ingredients, and so we've got lots of studies on hold uh, but otherwise otherwise everything's healthy and, and working really well um, i think this is a great time to be taking stock of the claims that you have concerning the cosmetics uh, that you're making or that you're selling or uh, you know whatever part you are in the process um, because now more than ever the internet is uh, the most prevalent means of purchase and so consequently people have the time to browse uh, the information about your products and in particular the claims that you make about them. Um, so more than anything, our service, I just want to sort of drop some context into what Karis is going to cover today. Our service is really a commercial enterprise that is aimed at helping you to become more commercially minded about uh, the way in which you sell, about expansion, about export, about satisfying lots of different global markets rather than just your more local markets. Uh, and so today's specialism is about uh, the European legislative framework for advertising claims. But the context is that we actually test goods all over the world. And this means that we're compliant with all of um, the European standards, but also all of the global advertising standards that exist. Um, so during your, your lecture today with Karis, please think big. It really doesn't cost very much more money to split some of your valuable samples across a number of different territories rather than just uh, one or two. Uh, there's a marginal difference, yes, but the difference that, that it could make to you and your global sales could be enormous. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand you back to Karis. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Sue. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll go through the agenda now and give you an idea of what today's lecture is all going to be about. Um, so you may have seen this already, um, but just kind of summarise, uh, we'll be looking at advertising standards for organisations which regulate them within Europe. Um, so we're going to be looking generally at Europe, um, really important if you are looking at importing into Europe or if you currently are in Europe and you're manufacturing products. Um, we'll be looking at a lot of cosmetics and personal care, but really this applies to any industry and we can also um, provide claim substantiation and evidential support for all industries. Um, but generally, I know a lot of you are from the cosmetics industry, so it will be generally tailored that way. Um, so yes, yeah, so really important if you're thinking about basically selling or manufacturing products within Europe. Um, we're going to look at the legislation surrounding advertising claims generally. We'll look at some challenges of advertising and exporting in Europe in terms of the regulations and legislation you need to be aware of. Um, I'm going to go through some case studies of some successful product tests that we've conducted within Europe, just to kind of um, put into context everything that I'm going to be talking about in terms of regulation. Um, and I'm also going to give you some examples of illegal and withdrawn adverts from Europe, um, just to, again, give you an idea of what can really go wrong if you don't know the regulations and if you're not kind of getting your claim substantiation in. 
Um, so yes, yeah, Sue's kind of introduced the um, introduced the webinar for us today. Um, but just to give you a background of who Sue is, <laughs> uh, so she's the founder and managing director of Aiton Global Research, which is our company. Um, so she started the company about 25 years ago and has a background in beauty therapy and teaching and basically used all of that um, experience um, to provide the service that we have today, which is about consumer research. So she's got a huge amount of um, experience in terms of having started the company and still working very much very actively as our managing director today and still very much at the forefront of any um, developments that happen within the industry, um, whether that's the cosmetics industry or uh, the research industry. Um, she's very much yeah, very proactive in making sure that we're very much at the forefront and that we're innovative, innovative <laughs> um, with everything that we're producing as well. Um, to introduce myself, I'm the regulatory specialist uh, for AT and Global Research. So um, I basically started off um, managing studies and understanding um, basically how, how it all works, what clients need and how we get that evidence to help support their claims, um, as well as researching things for their um, product development. Um, and then I found that I've really, um, really enjoyed um, training people, really training the clients um, in how to do it. But the regulations is where my passion was. It's, you know, why do we do these things? Um, how the evidence that we can provide makes people make sure people are, are being, you know, legal and compliant and keeping them out of trouble um, and just finding that journey really interesting. So that's where I've kind of focused all of my energy is looking at the regulations in all industries um, and, and all research to make sure um, that you know everything that we're providing for our clients is, is completely compliant um, and that I'm able to really help people make amazing marketing claims about their product um, as well as being legally compliant. Um, so I just want to give an overview first about the cosmetics market within Europe. Again, this is going to be quite cosmetic driven, um, so I do apologise if you're part of the cosmetics industry, but um, it will be very applicable to all um, industries anyway. So to give an idea of the cosmetics market, so it's, it's the largest in the world. Um, this was written last year, but obviously it's still very much prevalent. The European market, you know, it, it, it basically contains all of Europe. So it is the largest in the world. The main um, kind of markets you're looking at are Germany, France, the UK and Spain. Um, so we find, you know, we, we do a lot of um, tech product tests of people where they might be looking at all of these markets. Um, so yeah, really important. If you're not already in, in Europe um, and you're looking to import into Europe, that's a great incentive to do so. And if you're already manufacturing in Europe and importing in Europe, um, again, another incentive to make sure that you are aware of the regulations because you'll be selling a lot of products, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so again, 72% uh, of all consumers across all age groups in Europe um, do use uh, personal care. So again, it's just, it's just a huge market and you, you are going to be um, appealing to a lot of different um, people when you're selling products in the uh, in Europe um, and then again there's an increasing demand for natural ingredients this seems to be a bit of a trend across all of the webinars I've been hosting uh, whether it's product specific or um, whether it's you know it's territory specific um, we're looking very much at natural ingredients and we're also looking at people that care about the raw material composition. So we've seen that a lot recently where you've got brands that, you know, just state what the ingredient is. Um, consumers are becoming a lot more savvy about understanding what those ingredients mean and maybe looking for ingredients, um, maybe for example, AHA or retinol then they're looking for those ingredients because they know the effect that it has they've done their research and that's what they're looking for so again it's something to really think about it's prevalent in europe um maybe about kind of yeah when you're looking at branding you're looking at advertising getting an idea of what's really in on trend um in this in this territory at the moment I really want to bring up COVID-19 and the pandemic that's currently happening I think it's really important too um but basically, uh, so particularly in Europe, um, there has been a decline in cosmetic products um, market. Um, a lot of this is to do, do, due to the lockdown situation that's going on and how a lot of um, manufacturers have had to close and stop production. Um, I know that for a lot of my clients, there's been issues of getting raw ingredients supplies. Um, so very much keen to get a product launch still going, but it's, it's quite difficult to do so. Things are getting better um, and we've definitely noticed that. Um, so especially, you know, in, in um, a lot of Europe now, lockdown is kind of easing in the UK where I'm based. We know that next month, all things going well, we'll start to see some non-essential shops open up again, including, all, you know, where you can buy all your cosmetics and everything like that. 
So it's really important to kind of keep focused and not kind of get it put off. Obviously, there's certain things that we can't control. But as lockdown eases, you know, lockdown is eased again in the UK. So um, workers can start getting back. So hopefully we can start getting some of those um, manufacturers back up and running. So basically, my point is, is really start thinking about if you've got any product launches planned, don't start delaying them. Carry on going forward as you can, because things will start going slightly back to normal. You know, it's only 100% back to normal probably ever. Um, but it's going to be going slightly back to normal. We're going to get some more consumers out there. People are going to be going back into stores, even though people are already buying online anyway. Um, and so, yeah, keep, keep your drive going and keep these um, product launches going. Um, cosmetics Design in Europe, I also wanted to bring this up. Oh, cosmetics Europe, sorry. They've got the Working Together platform, which they describe as a one-stop shop to all information on the ongoing crisis. And they've got links to all of the EU guidance and any regulatory, regulatory updates. So really um, good platform to look at if you're really not sure about what's going on with um, the regulations um, and if you need any guidance, basically, um, to do with what's going on, basically, in the current situation. So to kind of um, bring it back to the content of the webinar, so about our advertising standards. So I want to talk, start, start off by talking about the EASA, which is the European Advertising Standards Alliance. So in a lot of countries worldwide, um, and particularly in Europe, actually, there are self-regulatory organisations. Um, and what these organisations do is they act as a kind of voice for the people um, and they act as a control to make sure that all advertising that's being put into the public domain isn't misleading, that it's responsible, that it's truthful, that you've got evidential support and all of these kinds of things. And they deal with complaints from consumers and they deal with complaints from your competitors possibly about your product and they manage the case to make sure that you, you know, they ask you for your evidential support and make sure that you're not putting any misleading ads out there. They also do things like make sure that your ads are not offensive. Um, so there's a lot to do with that as well. But really, we're going to be focusing on the uh, kind of claims and the evidential support. So the EASA has, the, uh, has a network of 40 organizations. 27 of those are the SROs and 13 of them are avatar, basically advertising organizations. Um, so the SROs are really what we could, we're kind of concerned about in terms of this lecture again, because they're the people that be investigating it. But the 13 organizations that are from an advertising ecosystem are basically, they're there to make sure, so for example, um, think of Clearcast in the UK, which is looking at, you know, it's responsible advertising on television. It's kind of organizations like that, which again, are making sure that they understand the code of conduct for the EASA and what the regulations are and what they suggest for advertising and making sure that all of the content that is being put out into the public domain within their countries is responsible. So again, it's legal, decent, honest, truthful. These are the kinds of things you're really thinking about when you're thinking about advertising and about fair competition as well. So we want to drive comp competition. Absolutely, it's really important for the industry and it's really important for advertising, but it has to be fair. So this is really what they're looking at. So the EASA is basically the place where I start. If we're thinking about EU advertising or European advertising, they're the best place to start off with because you know that anything that they put into their code of conduct, um, it, that's exactly uh, what the other SROs are going to have adopted as well. And generally, they're a bit of a drive for the rest of the world. So if I kind of skip on to the next slide here, um, you've got ICAST, which is the International Council for Advertising Standards. Now, they were set up by the EASA. And they're basically one platform uh, where there's kind of a council of all these different self-regulatory organizations that are coming together and sharing the same principles and sharing the same code of conduct. The reason I bring this up is because the EASA have become almost a um, kind of set, like a setter in what the standards are. And it's exactly represented here with ICAST because there are other countries across the world coming you know, to the ICAST council and saying, yeah, we wanna be a part of your regulation. Any updates that you've got will adopt into ours. And I always say this, when we're conducting consumer research studies for any of our clients for claim substantiation, even if the test isn't within Europe, um, before I even think about um, kind of other regulations, we're basically, I always base it on the EU, on the European, on the EASA regulations first, because you know you're pretty much settling any other regulations. Then we can delve into that country and see if there's anything that we're missing that's part of their regulation. In my experience so far, um, I have not um, sort of seen any uh, country that has a stricter regulation than the EASA in terms of advertising. They are very much um, the kind of uh, people there 
that they're that really setting all the rules um, kind of worldwide. The only difference is there's some countries that have better organizations rather than SROs that are monitoring ads. So it's slightly more different because you've got to be more careful because of law and things like that. Um, so yeah, I guess is uh, another good place to start if you're looking at going outside of the outside of Europe, but we're going to focus on Europe today. Um, so I just want to bring up some of those SROs to give you some, again, some context and kind of delve it down a little bit further. We've looked at the EASA, but who are some of those um, organisations that belong to that um, and that are regulating ads in their own countries? So in the UK, we've got the ASA. In France, you've got the Authority for Self-Regulation of Advertising. In Germany, you've got the German Advertising Standards Council. Italy's the Institute for Advertising Self-Regulation. And Russia is the Russian Advertising Council. So I really wanted to bring this up because um, the UK, France, Germany, and Italy are all part of the EASA. Russia is an observer of the EASA, which means they recognize um, their rules, they recognize their code of conduct, but they're not a member, which means I guess they can be slightly more lenient um, on how... Um, what the punishment is, or they could be stricter. They basically, they, they aren't going up, up with the same punishment um, that's kind of as part of the ESA if you do go against the advertising regulations. So it's just something to bring up is, is that there are, you know, all these little odd quirky rules <laughs> when looking at advertising in certain countries. Um, but because uh, Russia is an observer of the ESA, you know that again, as I said, they're kind of, they're looking at these regulations as a standard um, for all of your advertising. So really good place to start again. There's also different European um, advertising laws. Um, so, and this is the same again worldwide, but we're looking at Europe in particular. Um, so even if there's not an SRO in that country, or if there is an SRO in that country, a lot of advertising compliance is put into law. Um, so I just kind of uh, brought up a few different examples here. So. In Croatia, uh, you've got um, the Electronic Media Act, which is protecting consumers from misleading advertising. Um, in the EU, you've got um, the um, EU approach has actually been transposed into Romanian law, sorry, in Rom Romania. Um, and then again, you've got a similar kind of uh, kind of authority in Malta, which is about competition and consumer affairs. So again, it's just all these laws that and all these, these authorities that have been put into place. So don't feel like you just need to look at the SROs when you're looking at advertising in a country. It's really important to be aware of what the laws are, because it's one thing to go against an SRO's code of conduct and have your advert withdrawn. And it's another thing to make your ads illegal. Um, so, yeah, really important, again, to be aware of all of this. And just some other organizations to be thinking of when you're looking at advertising. There's the Advertising Information Group, um, which is to do with, uh, this is, sorry, the members include Austria, Germany, and the UK. Um, so they're basically, again, they're looking at responsible advertising, kind of another organization that's bringing together updates and advertising law and everything like that. And they release um, bi-weekly newsletters as well. So worth subscribing to, um, they're, they're kind of looking at putting together um, all of the, um, you know, making sure that they can propose things that are put into EU law uh, when it comes to advertising. So anything that they're kind of looking at um, is again, really important to be aware of because they, they can be giving it updates of what they're proposing to go into EU law. Um, and the European Commission, so this isn't to do, in, to do with advertising, um, this is now looking at cosmetics in quite particular, basically. Um, so you've got all of your advertising regulations to be aware of, and then it's being uh, making sure that your actual product is compliant. Um, so the European Commission is looking at um, all of the legislation and uh, decisions and everything to do with the EU, basically. And one of the regulations is about cosmetic products, and they've got a regulatory framework for finished cosmetic products, which is looking at everything that you need, all of the um, everything you need about uh, to sorry everything you need to register your product in the EU, and that includes what kind of evidence that you need. So really important to be aware of the European Commission if you're looking at branching out into the EU. Uh, another, per, per, uh, sorry, another organisation to be aware of uh, when you're looking at Europe um, is the CTPA. So they have a really useful resource for kind of really breaking down any kind of um, EU regulations, but also UK regulations. They do both. You know, obviously Brexit, as we know, is going to be happening this year. They're looking at both of the time and they're looking at Europe as a whole. Um, so they're really, really good at breaking down those regulations. They tend to talk to um, kind of, uh, the, you know, the EU regulate 
people that decide the EU regulations basically, um, and they'll negotiate things. So if, if something comes into um, law and they, don't, they think it's going to be damaging to the cosmetics industry, they'll either get further clarification or they might um, negotiate with what that law should be. So they're really, really important and really understanding what the regulations are when it comes to cosmetics. Um, and they also give some really helpful advice on claim substantiation. Um, they actually had a webinar this morning. Um, I, I recommend catching up if you are a member um, because that was all about um, claim substantiation as well. Um, but obviously looking at a much more bro broader um, kind of idea, I think what today, today I'll kind of come into it in a bit more detail and look at some case studies, but it doesn't mean that it's not helpful, it's incredibly helpful. Um, and, and in fact, as a regulatory specialist for the industry, it's where I get a lot of my um, information as well. So definitely recommend the CTPA. So I've kind of given you the overall, um, the overarching theme about advertising and who those people are and what are the organisations. Now I really want to talk about um, what we do, consumer research, and how that fits in to everything that I've talked about with advertising. So consumer research is all about consumer perception. You might have heard of it as in-home tests or user trials as well. Um, so what we're looking at is we're looking at what the um, cons consumers can actually perceive when they test a product, um, what they can perceive with their naked eye. So there's also instrumental studies and scientific studies, which you may need to substantiate your claims. In some cases, you need one or the other, but in a lot of cases, you need both, because even though you've got the science to say that a product can do what it can do, there's nothing to say the consumer can actually perceive that when they use the product. Um, so we're really looking at providing that evidence to making sure you can substantiate your claims. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's the main reason why you might use consumer research is for claim substantiation, but I also wanted to break down some of the other um, reasons as well before we kind of go um, into those case studies. So there's new product development. So this is all about, you know, really researching and understanding your product before you even get to the point where you might be looking at substantiating the claims. If you've purchased some raw ingredients and you've got the claims behind them, you might very much go, well, I want, I want to really test this in its final package and its final um, formula now and make sure that we're going down the right route with the efficacy um, before getting to the point where we really have the final product. Um, so it's really important for new product development to really get some ideas. And that includes things like benchmark testing and reformulation. Um, again, you might want to find out where your product sits within its market, test it against other competitors. Um, and you might want to test it against other formulations you've made to, again, to sit, uh, see where it sits. You really might want to investigate um, your new markets and get a sort of feedback on the product and the brand perceptions in those new markets. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of tests in, in Asia and we do find that, um, you know, products that could be very successful over here might not necessarily be accepted the same way. And it couldn't be to do with how, you know, it might not be to do with how the product is, but it might be how to do, um, to do with the usage directions or something like that and how it's not perceived in the same way. So it's not like you have to reformulate the product, but you just have to think slightly differently about how you're approaching that market with your product, how you're branding it, how you're explaining how the usage is. Um, it gives you a lot of opportunity before you launch a product somewhere, regardless of the claim substantiation of whether it's actually going to do well over there. Um, and if there's anything you need to change about it before you launch it, which is obviously going to be a really expensive um, situation if you kind of do it retrospectively. Um, so it's really getting feedback on all of these things like packaging design and the price points. Also testimonials and reviews, uh, another really great marketing um, opportunity when it comes to consumer research, um, because you're really finding out, you know, you know getting all those uh, reviews that kind of say this is the best product I've ever used, you can use it on your website, as long as it's reflected in the, in the, in the um, scientific evidence we've got in the data, as long as it reflects the general nature of the data that's getting got from the questionnaire, you can use those testimonials in your marketing. So again, consumer perception um, claims are really what I think sells your product. Um, it's not really the claims that say um, hair is five times stronger. Um, that's fine. Um, but really what people are going to be looking at is, you know, that my hair felt um, like it had less breakage. Um, I noticed less hair coming out when I was brushing it. Um, I would recommend this product to my family and friends. I would buy this product. My hair looks the shiniest it ever has. These are the kinds of claims that are really going to speak to your consumer that go beyond that scientific evidence. Um, so yeah, I think it's really, really important to kind of look at consumer research as one of your options um, for evidential support when looking at claim substantiation. 
Um, and it's really, it's, it's really about the marketing as well. When we're looking at consumer research, we're not just going, okay, this is the evidential support that we have. Can I make this claim? We're finding out what we can say about this product and how we can use it in our marketing to really make our product smell, a spell, sell, sorry. <laughs> to really make our product sell. As Sue said, uh, it's, we're commercially minded. Um, that's how we're looking at this. It's about how much we can, we can introduce to your product to make it, give it real value in its branding. Um, so I want to bring up some examples of how our claims are used, um, and how our evidence is used to, to make claims um, out in the public domain, basically. So these are examples of claims that are used online. Um, so I've lifted these straight from the product websites, um, right, right from the company websites. So you've got Eleanor's, Philip Kingsley, Charlotte Tilbury, and these are all claims that they've managed to get through uh, consumer research um, and you know what they've been able to say about their products so you, as you can see I mean these are particularly high claims we've got 100% there we've got some 90% um, and yeah so excellent claims that are used about their product now that is what's going to sell your product when people go onto your website to purchase a product and they see these kinds of claims on there um, it's going to shout out a lot more than the products that don't have these kinds of claims and then add that with some testimonials and you're looking at a very very um, powerful advertising campaign so I just, yeah, I just kind of want to bring up those examples there. Also on television, um, so particularly, you know, in the EU and in the UK, you absolutely must put the amount of people um, that, you know, where, where the evidence came from. So what is the amount of um, percentage of people that agreed with the claim um, when it goes on to television? Um, so I've just got some examples there from a lipstick ad, for a face cream ad, and from a John Frieda hair care ad. Um, and it just, as you can see, it says 80% of 100 women agree, 77% of 207 agree, and 78% of 50-50 women agree as well. Um, so again, yeah, you need that evidence before you're even allowed to advertise on TV, and then it must display on your TV advert. Another platform is shopping channels. Um, so to be able to, um, to even apply to be, have your product shown on a shopping channel, I've brought up QVC because it's the most common one and they've got some really um, succinct advice on their website about what information you'd need to be able to apply. You must have reliable scientific evidence, such as analysis, research, independent verifiable studies or other evidence um, to make sure that your claims are substantiated before you can even think about going on the shopping channel. This is because every single piece of script that they say must be substantiated. Otherwise, it's a misleading advert. You know, that the, they are going to be under the most scrutiny of anyone um, when it comes to the SROs, for example, the ASA. These, this is the company um, that are going to come under the most scrutiny because they're putting out the most adverts constantly. So I've put a list there of kind of different, um, you know, what, what their um, requirements are for that evidence. Um, so yeah, feel free to have a look at that. And I'll send this round after as well. Um, but yeah, if you're looking at any shopping channels as well, it doesn't have to be just QVC, see what information they are saying um, that they would need um, for, yeah, for you to be able to apply to have your product on there. So now I've gone through um, yeah, the general how you use those claims. Um, I wanna go through some case studies just to show you how um, basically we go from concept to study um, to the marketing. Um, so you know, people would tend to come to us with, a, um, with an idea of the, the product they wanna test um, and the claims they wanna make about that product and then we'll and, and the market sorry that they want to launch that product into. And then we can design a, design a study, which means not only have they got their claims substantiated but that they can use it on every platform they need to and that they've got some really powerful advertising claims so the first product i want to talk about is from a world leading manufacturer of certified natural personal care products and they're looking at testing a facial oil they wanted to make sure that their new formula was accepted as well or better than the previous formula. So we're not just looking at claim substantiation here, we're also looking at our benchmark testing. So they've got a new formula. It could be to do with um, just a, a, a change in formula. It could be because they can't get the same raw ingredient anymore, or they're changing supplier. These are all really common reasons why people might want to do a test against their old formula and the new formula. Um, so the current biggest markets for them are France and Germany. So it was really important for us to do this test in France and Germany because that's where they knew that know that the most of their consumers are. Um, so what's the legislation? So obviously it's in France and Germany, but I've just pulled up France to give you an idea. So again, I just want to contextualize. I've talked about all the SROs, I've talked about advertising standards, I've talked about those regulations, but where, you know, what, how does it um, fit together with the test that we're doing? And yeah, what's the actual legislation they're saying, which means that they have to do these tests? 
So in France, they say the advertiser must be able to support its claims by means of evidence that is reliable, objective, and verifiable at the time of advertising. So before you even think about putting your, and this is said a lot, before you put your advert out there, you should have that evidence in place. This isn't always the case, and I'm aware of it. And if you are concerned that you have adverts out there that aren't substantiated, um, you can come and talk to us because it's really important that you get it substantiated anyway, or remove your advert from um, the public domain. But really, it should be in place before you put your advert out into the public domain anyway. Um, so the protocol for this study, this was in Germany and France, um, as we discussed. So dual comparison, because we're looking at comparing two facial oils. It's a two-week study, just a week per product, because we're not looking at the long-lasting effects of the product, and we're just looking to see, you know, is it accepted in the same way just by their initial response? It can be quite a short study. Um, so it's an even rotation sample distribution to kind of explain that a little bit. What it means is the participants are separated into two groups. One of them is going to test product A first, the other is going to test product B first, and then they're going to switch for the second week. This removes the kind of bias from the first product being tested or the second product being tested. They answer a questionnaire that's identical for both products, and then we can literally match each um, attribute and say whether there's been a significant difference or not. I'm going to break that down a little bit on the next slide. Um, so again, we're looking at people that use facial oils um, normally and that have normal dry and sensitive skin type because that is who the target consumer is. You know, you're not going to buy it if you've got greasy skin. You're going to be buying it if you have these kinds of skin types. And they want people that generally use natural skincare products because, again, that's their target consumer. Um, so I said I kind of break down a bit more about what the comparison means. Um, so this is lifted straight from our report. Um, our reports, just to explain as well, are in real time. So it means that all of the statistical analysis that you're gonna to see today, um, that's all generated immediately. So as soon as the minimum amount of responses comes in for each product, um, it's all put through our system. It's got immediate statistical analysis. There's no waiting for a final report. That all happens straight away. So from the moment you get your minimum responses, say it's 100 responses on your study, you can view that report and see all of the analysis. You haven't got to wait for us to go away and analyze it. It's something that's really attractive for people in this industry because as we all know, lead times are very, very tight. And generally we're the kind of last step. People have got their pack copy printed, they've got their advertising printed and they're waiting for the go ahead to say, yes, you've got the evidential support you need. And then they kind of launch it out into the um, public domain. So it's really important to know that all of this is gonna be straight at your fingertips all the time. Um, so this is to do with the comparison of the products anyway. So we had two product codes with 0016 and 0024. Um, and what I wanted to just break down, obviously, is just a really small lift. Um, you've got your two means there. Um, so the mean average, that would be on a scale. I'll explain a, bit, a little bit on the next slide. Um, but it's 4.55 and 4.21 out of something. And our report could say that between those mean averages, um, in the confidence interval that we had, there is evidence that the two samples differ. So there was evidence that 0016, which has a higher mean average, um, was more effective at making your skin feel more soft and supple. Now this is um, the, uh, the, the, the summary table. So at the end of every report, so you get all your question breakdown individually, and then you get this um, summary table which shows all of the different claims about the product and then says how many people agreed with it. So on the left-hand side, we've got our question and we've got that broken down for each product code as well because obviously you've got two different products, so 0016 and 0024. We've got the number of people that said they were satisfied, the number of people that said they were neutral, the number of people that said they weren't satisfied, and then again with percentage for satisfied, neutral, and not satisfied. So what we're looking for when we're looking at claims is the percentage of satisfied. Um, so yeah, this is the, uh, so for soft and supple, which is what we had before, as I said, 0016 had the higher mean average, but we can also see it had the higher percentage at 96.55%, which is an incredibly high percentage. And we've also got my skin feels energized to give you an idea of that as well. And you can see that they did significantly better in the percentages as well for that one for 0016. Um, so yeah, it just gives you an idea of how you can compare that, but also how it displays um, for our claim substantiation, because then they can go, okay, 0016 is the best formula. That's what I'm going to put out there. Um, and this is, um, you know, these are the claims that I can say about it. I can say 96% said it felt more soft and supple, and 93% said my skin felt more energized. 
Uh, the next one I want to go through is a day and night cream study we did for a um, global leader in retail and wholesale pharmacy and health and beauty products. Um, so we're looking at day and night cream used together and they want to make sure that the claims are substantiated in their key markets in Europe, which is Spain, Germany, France, Italy and Portugal. So we wanted to make sure we were testing in all of those um, key markets because again, not just claim substantiation, but they really want to make sure that their product is accepted in all of those key markets. Um, and the key, the key claims that they're looking for are suitable for skin types, anti-aging, and that it performs well in a hot climate. So again, let's have a little look about the let's have a little little look at the legislation. Again, we've got a lot of countries there, and I didn't want to sort of break down every single SRO's code of conduct. Um, so I've just picked Italy. Um, so again, Italy is saying that all marketing must be capable of substantiation and that they should always be available for people to review, um, so this for their review board to have a look at if it comes under scrutiny at all and they can um, make sure they can prove the truthfulness of the data basically. Um, so yeah, basically always make sure again that you have your um, evidential support ready because if it ever comes under scrutiny, you need to be able to provide that straight away and particularly in Italy. So what was the study protocol for this particular study? Again, we were looking at Spain, Germany, um, France, Italy and Portugal. That's why that's the languages. <laughs> um, the regime was two products. We had a day and night cream that had to be used together. And this because they're looking at getting a combined claim, by the way. So we're not just looking at the claim they get from the day cream or the claim they get to the night cream. The claim they're looking to really make as well is that when they're used together, they're providing these effects. Um, it helps you sell products as a regime. So it's a six-week study because we're looking at anti-aging, so generally we're looking at a bit of a longer study duration because we know that, that it takes a while for the product to have an effect. Uh, it's a bit of a build-up effect when we're looking at anti-aging generally. We had to have all skin types, which is really common for this um, particular retailer because they want to make sure that they're um, completely encompassing of all skin types, including sensitive skin. And the reason um, that so for that they've put 25% sensitive skin um, because obviously they're making sure they've got a substantial amount on that panel that have sensitive skin as well. They've broken down their skin phototypes as well and this will be again to do with the aging skin. They want to make sure they've got um, the right phototypes. Um, again, age group people that would use anti-aging products um, and they don't want pe people that are non-users of anti-aging products on the study. So what were the results that we got from this um, study? Um, as you can see, this was a really large study because it was really important that we were reflect having a breakdown across all those territories. So we're looking at about 300 people in total um, that actually responded to so maybe about 360 people um, on the study overall. Um, so this is looking at the overall report from all of the territories. There's also the opportunity to break down each territory and look at that individually. Um, so for this one, we had um, my skin is protected from redness and flushing associated with the heat. Uh, we're looking at hot countries, obviously, in those markets. Um, the serum is suitable for use in the summer. Uh, the serum is reduced to my wrinkles. Um, my skin feels boosted with vitality. Uh, again, this is just a selection of claims that we had, um, but important to think about the context. So again, we really wanted to think about the heat. These are hot climates in the territories. We're looking at summer and we want to make sure that people are really happy to use it during this time of year. Um, and then again, we're looking at those kind of youthfulness um, and anti-aging associated quotes as well. Um, so once you've done your consumer research, uh, once you've done your studies, you obviously need to submit that evidence somewhere. So that's submitted in your product information file or your product information pack. Um, as you know, if you are in the cosmetics industry, you need to have a cosmetic um, a product information file for every SKU that you produce. It includes things like your safety data and your cost listings, but it also must, um, it must contain all the information about the research that you've got or the evidential support and who has conducted that research um, to make sure that they're a credible researcher um, and an independent testing house as well. It also contains information about undesirable effects that have been reported. So it's important to note um, that we also have undesirable effects reporting on our consumer studies. So even though this is something that you'll generally get during your safety tests um, and your kind of uh, patch tests and things like that, um, you will still also get a certain amount of undesirable events reporting for a consumer test. Generally, we don't get many reported um, because it's already been safety tested and it's already had their allergy tests um, and the kind of, yeah, that kind of test um, behind it. Um, but we do see some. We don't tend to see any serious undesirable events. 
um, because again, that's really unlikely when a product's already been safety tested. Um, but that is all important for your responsible person to have um, access to. Um, so yeah, that's all kind of every single test that we do. There's another layer, um, which is the undesirable event reporting, which a participant can report their undesirable event at any point. Um, which moves me on to our standards. Um, so I've told you about, you know, everything, the consumer research claim substantiation uh, and why you should use consumer research to substantiate claims, but why should you use us as a supplier? So I've talked about undesirable event reporting and how important that is. Um, so that's all in accordance with the Cosmetic Vigilance Act. Um, again, the responsible person has access to that at any point. Um, we provide logins to everyone who needs it from every company. So your responsible person can have a login um, to our um, software. And like I said, they can see all of those reports in real time. They can see the undesirable events in real time and they can see your um, product report in real time as well. So it's a really, um, really helpful um, kind of system there. We've got product liability insurance as well. Um, so this protects us and our clients um, from anything that could be wrong on the test itself. Um, so it's not, you know, you need to have product liability insurance anyway for anything you're putting in the market. Um, but of course, we need to be protected for the actual test we're putting out there because if there was any incorrect information and someone did suffer an a serious undesirable event, again, this has not happened. So please don't be panicked. Um, it just protects everyone to make sure that everyone is covered in that event. Um, we're completely compliant with the GDPR and again being specific to Europe, which this webinar is, that, that's um, completely necessary. It's a complete, uh, to be compliant we absolutely must um, adhere to the GDPR um, re regulations and we've got an ISO 27001 uh, uh, which does um, audit us basically on our ability to be um, compliant with the GDPR and we have our own data protection officer who um, manages all day to day um, data protection affairs anyway. And um, this protects not just our participants and our volunteers that are on our system, um, but it also protects you because obviously you're giving us really sensitive data about new product launches. Um, so it's really important that we are yeah, completely adhering to the GDPR for that reason. We've also got an ISO 9001, which is to do with our quality control and our quality assurance. And we're a partner to the Market Research Society, um, which basically lets you know that we are you know, completely following their code of conduct. So we, our research that we're conducting is ethical and it's proper. Um, we do things like MRS training for questionnaire design, um, making sure that, again, everything um, that we're putting out there for you could come under scrutiny and it can be seen as completely fair. Um, some further advice for consumer studies. Um, so I always say, about, so I'll say quickly about the product liability insurance because we have just covered that. But again, always inform your product liability insurance if you're thinking of doing consumer studies. Um, make sure that you're starting a panel of around 100 responses depending on the breakdown. So it could be per territory, um, it could be per SKU. Um, and there are some cases where you don't need as many as 100 responses. Um, it really depends on the ev evidential support you already have. Um, behind your claim and it really depends on the claims that you're looking to make so always feel free to reach out um, because we can really help with study design it's a big part of my job is to provide a gap analysis to look at the products that you have to look at the claims you want to make and to look at the evidential support that you already have and the key markets you want to launch into and create you a really succinct um, test design and suggest other tests that might be um, necessary. So like I said, we conduct the consumer tests, but I'm always very honest. If I think you need an instrumental test or a scientific test to further substantiate your claim, we will help you provide you with that as well from one of our um, really trusted partners. So always make sure that your products have been safety tested. Um, again, we're putting these products out into the hands of our panelists, which are essentially like putting them into the hands of a consumer. Um, so they need to be tested to that point. Um, so they need to be fully safety tested. Always make sure your samples are debranded. If you're looking at claim substantiation, this removes any bias towards the product. Um, and especially if you're doing debt benchmark testing, the products must be in the same packaging because otherwise there could be a bias there as well. Um, and ensure your questionnaire design will support your claims so we can really help with this. As I mentioned, we are we're all trained by the MRS. Um, so make sure that, um, yeah, you, every kind of question that you've got there will support every claim that you want to make. 
Um, just to kind of finish up, I want to talk about some removed ads again to give you the kind of like this is the problem if you don't do your claim substantiation and put any misleading ads out on here. It's bad press, basically. That is, you know, one of the worst, one of the worst penalties for it, especially in Europe. That's kind of one of the worst um, penalties. Um, it, it is getting that bad press about that product. And for all of these um, examples I've brought up, we're not necessarily saying um, that the that the that the claims weren't um, true you know they they could very much be true but they just haven't been substantiated yet so they could find if they did a consumer test um that a lot of these um products you know could could have very much had those claims um but they just haven't been substantiated so you can't say them um so things like um so there's some i'll get brought some other examples up here actually as well so the the pantem one in the middle was very much about um the the um product has not um, had any scientific evidence to substantiate the claim um, even things like the claim they said up to 10 times stronger so it springs back to life that's quite a perception claim um, so really important to make sure you have that kind of evidence the L'Oreal sunscreen ad is to do about a misleading ad in terms of that they said it had a five star UVA um, and previously there was only a three star so it sounded like it was better than the three star products but that was the highest rating before um, so that's kind of an, an idea of how you can get done with misleading ads there and the essay Lauder claim, um, again, this is I wouldn't bring this up because it says that their, their sales were blemished by false advertising revelations. So again, you can see a real reduction in your advertising. And in this case, um, they were using their internal data to substantiate some claims in um, the USA, um, which can be allowed over there for certain claims, um, but not for all claims as well. So <laughs> always take that evidence. But they used some of their internal testing house data um, and they found that their members of staff were actually manipulating the data um, to say that it was better than it was. Another really a good example of why it's important to use an independent testing house because they're not biased towards your brand. Um, there's no kind of chance to manipulate data there. They're giving you the pure, pure honest truth. Um, and yeah, you could get found out for doing something like that, which is pretty awful. So now I'm going to open up to a QA. and a um, So I think I've had some questions come in already. Oh back on there um so i'll have a little look if you had anything in but yeah feel free to type away your questions and i will do my best to answer them um so i've got a question to come in here um suitable for in skin or skin type sorry you mentioned this includes sensitive skin however is sensitive skin not considered a skin condition more than a skin than a type so you're absolutely correct um if we're looking at it scientifically it can be um and this is because um you know you might have a dermatologist assess that you have sensitive skin but as you may know um and a lot of us do that actually i think that the percentage of people who say they have sensitive skin and who actually have sensitive skin it is a huge difference. I myself say I have sensitive skin. I don't even know if I do, I've never had it assessed, but I have self-assessed sensitive skin. So you can have, um, you can have uh, scientific studies that say if a, skin, a product is suitable for a sensitive skin type, which is needed, it's safe for sensitive skin, there's no kind of um, irritation reported there. But when you're looking at the claim, you wanna get make sure you have people that have self-assessed sensitive skin who are testing the product because it means that when it's put out into the market and people are purchasing it, and again, if someone um, complains about it and says, oh, I've got you know, self-assessed sensitive skin, I used this product, it didn't suit my skin type, they've made sure they've got a substantial amount of people on that study with self-assessed sensitive skin. Um, so if their, their claim ever comes under scrutiny, they've got that evidence there. So I hope that answers your question. I'll just check to see if we've got any more come in yet. Uh, so there's no more questions in there yet, but I'm going to leave that open for a minute if anyone's got any further questions they'd like to ask. And I can't see anything coming in, so I don't want to hold you off all too long. Um, two seconds. Can you hear me okay? Oh, hi, Sue. Oh, so I've got one more question come in and, um, and then I'll just um, pass over to you as well, Sue. Um, so one more question come in, which is what is the requirement for suits or skin types? Um, so generally, again, there needs to be some sort of safety assessment to say that it's um, applicable to use on sensitive skin. That's the main one. 
but then really you're looking at getting a panel base for a consumer test which has every skin type covered um, so we'll do things like break it down into um, dry normal oily combination and sensitive that's our usual breakdown um, and then we'll get a substantial amount of every single skin type onto our study and ask them a question um, so something along the lines of this product is suitable for my skin type and again that has um, covered that it's the same when you're looking at hair type it's the same when you're looking at things like um, curl type um, it's always just making sure that you have a substantial breakdown of every single um, skin type. So for example, um, the reason for that might be you might find that all of the people with oily skin actually said it didn't suit their skin type. Um, so you can remove that data and you've still got a substantial amount of people with other skin types on there. And it means that you can um, have a look. Um, uh, yeah, have a look at um, just using that data to substantiate the claims and take away that it's okay for, um, for, for oily skin because it's not. Um, and then, sorry, I've got another question there. So when we look at ethically, uh, ethnically suits all skin types, so again, other ethnicities, really good question because we do this one as well. Um, so we might look at all ethnicities, skin type, hair type, everything like that. And in that case, I'd be looking at um, to, uh, separating the study into the territories. So we might select um, sort of a, a classic breakdown of um, ethnicities that we know that is going to is going to be selling this product too. So we could have Caucasian, Asian, um, Latino, Black, and we'll do again a substantial breakdown of every single ethnicity on the um, on the study. Uh, really common in the USA when people are testing in the USA because obviously the there's quite a diverse um, amount of um, ethnicities out there. So they want to make sure they have a substantial amount of people in each one, or at least a, refle a, a demographic reflection of who will actually be purchasing their products. Um, so yeah, so I can talk about this all day, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I will, um, I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I can talk about this specifically if you've got any products in mind um, and if you've got any claims. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I was trying not to talk too much. Uh, so I got another question in. So are ingredients based claims allowed, um, for example, use of an ingredient known for being moisturized and claiming that the final product is moisturizing. Um, so you can use ingredients claims um, in the fact that you can say that it contains an ingredients um, which has that effect. But to be able to say the product is moisturizing, you must have the final product tested. So generally, when we're looking at consumer studies, that's what we're looking at. Um, if you've got claims in mind, they tend to be derived from the raw ingredients. Um, so they tend to, you know, we tend to say, OK, well, we know that this ingredient is supposed to have this effect. That's the claims we want to make. But then we test the final product to ensure that, that those claims are now substantiated as a final product. So yeah, you can very much say this product, this um, product contains such and such an ingredient, which has this benefit, but you can't just say um, it's moisturizing if there's no evidential support about the final product itself. Cool, so I think that's all the questions we've got in for today. Um, so yeah, if you've got any further questions, please feel free to email me. I'm going to email this recording um, out to everyone at the end of the um, at the end of the recording. I'll get the link and everything like that. So everyone who's registered, you'll be sent the recording link, and I'll have my email address on there. So if you've got any further questions, please feel free to um, email me. I have my number on there as well, so you can feel free to call me. Um, so yeah, don't feel like you have to be put on the spot now. <laughs> if anything comes up after this, um, please just let me know. Sorry, Sue, did you want to um, have a closing statement here? Uh, well, I'm glad I've got a little bit of internet connectivity finally. <laughs> today but uh, no from what I've heard you've had an excellent lecture today and thank you so much to Karis. Uh, Marta actually brought up some of the comments that I was going to make about you know I started off at the beginning of this lecture saying think big think global and of course if you're thinking big and global then all skin types and all ethnicities really is the key to it and that's what our service handles particularly well because we've got panelists all over the world uh, and we, as I said at the beginning, we, we don't tend to charge extra for being able to split your uh, panels up into smaller panel criteria to make sure that your final result at the end really does reflect all skin types and all ethnicities. Um, you also need to take into account, as Karis has already mentioned, the ambient temperature. And so by choosing a mix of panelists in different countries with different ethnicities involved in different skin,
skin types involved. Uh, we're the experts in how to break that down so that you know that when you make a claim, it's going to be valid wherever you advertise. And it's just going back to that thing, by all means think European, but think globally at the same time because it's not going to cost you any more. And we know that budgets are going to be the main driving factor in terms of where and when you get your products tested. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something that we're really competent at. Um, the all skin types claim does include sensitive skin if your product is aimed at sensitive skin um, inclusively. If your product is solely uh, advertised for sensitive skin, then we would in fact increase the percentage of people who do have sensitive skin um, within the panel that are testing that particular product. Um, so yeah, I think that's my closing statement really, is just really think big. When you do your Google Analytics and you find out where a lot of your website sales are coming from, as soon as you notice that you have a proliferation of sales in a particular region, it's up to you entirely to make sure that your evidence is current and reflects those particular markets. Um, and going back to Karis's quotation about the French legislation, the uh, evidence that you have must be current. Now, some of the major clients that we work with, some global brands, uh, have a constant review um, of how recent their evidence is. And occasionally you may find that there's a product that's been on the market for a long time, that's sold really well. Maybe you've had to change the uh, raw ingredients to a degree according to availability and demand and so on. Uh, but if your products haven't been reviewed for quite some time, it might be that tests were carried out under old legislation that has since gone out. Uh, and it, it's funny because every time we do a lecture, we always get asked the same question about whether the claims for raw ingredients can be carried over um, to, to put on the final packing. And so I can only reiterate what Kara says. No, they can't because one particular raw ingredient may have an adverse effect on another. And when you mix the two together, you may find that one cancels out the effect of the other. So the emphasis is on testing the final product and what can consumers can reasonably perceive who replicate uh, very closely the markets that you want to sell your product in. Um, but as Kara said, um, her email address will be available if you've got any specific questions about a SKU uh, that you want to launch. That's the way that we operate, really. We look very, very closely at what it is you want to say about your product and also where in particular you want to sell it or what your aspirations are. And then we match the panel criteria to that to give you the greatest chance of success when you come to do some enormous sales um, agreement or when you come to enter into a new market. Uh, ju yeah, just keep thinking big and good luck during this pandemic. Um, I hope that we've had some inspirational comments today as well uh, and hope you'll feel inclined to go and review what your claims are and just how much we might be able to help you to grow those claims. Um, we were recently judges for the Pure Beauty Awards and uh, one of the things that I looked at very closely were the claims associated with those products and I think most awards schemes are going to go in that direction as time moves on. Uh, so it's not going to be just about the presentation of the packaging and the type of dispenser that you use and your aspirations for the products, it's going to be about the evidence that you have to prove that your products work. Um, so, again, thank you very much, Karis, for, day, for today. It's been really informative. I really appreciate it. Oh, great. Thanks, Sue. Um, I actually want to just finish. There's one more question come in. So before I forget and don't answer you, <laughs> I'll finish with that before closing off um, today's lecture. Um, so I've had one more question in, which just says, how long would you say a user trial is valid for? Five years, 10 years? Um, the thing is that there's no direct answer, which is often the case when it comes to claim substantiation. Um, as anything that we, you know, we always say, how long um, do you feel comfortable if you come under scrutiny? Because the ASA can turn around um, and say that it's not been long enough, even though there's no regulation. So if you're going to come under scrutiny and the, the, you know, the claim is 20 years old, the ASA may say this isn't good enough, even though they've not put a regulation out there for you to follow. So always keep that in mind. Um, and also for particular um, sort of distribution channels. Um, so for example, I talked about QVC earlier. 
you have to have evidence that was conducted within the last year to be able to advertise on QVC. So you cannot rely on old, old um, data. So again, there's no, there's no sweeping rule that there, and there often isn't for claim substantiation, um, but it is really important to have a think about where you're distributing. And also, again, as I always say, you need to feel confident and there's no regulation out there. You need to be very confident with the evidence you hold because you are always at risk for coming under scrutiny from an uh, from a, um, SRO. So that's all I can say about that one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just one other point to add about that particular question. If the law has changed, the advertising law has changed in the market in which you're trading uh, since you um, put the evidence together for those claims, that's a clear indicator that it is time uh, to run another study to substantiate those claims. So any kind of change in the advertising law, uh, any kind of change in your market, they're the two stimulators that should make you sort of sit up and think, is it time that I had another look at this uh, particular set of claims? Great, thank you, Sue. Great, so I'm going to close that off for today. As I said, feel free to get in contact if you do have any further questions. Um, so just to close off, um, I want to talk about the SES training and events. Um, so they've got their distance learning, <laughs> distance learning course, uh, which is a recognized course in the essentials of cosmetic science. And I think now is as good a time as any, as I keep saying, whilst we're in lockdown, where people aren't able to get to work and while there's less social events going on, maybe it's really a good time to sort of have a think about if you want to um, extend your education at all and look at the distance learning course. Um, so they've got some more inform information there at cosmeticlearning.com. Um, so yeah, I, I would I would urge people that if you're interested in kind of extending your knowledge on cosmetic science to have a little look at that. There's also going to be the IFSCC Congress, which is going to take a place in London in September 2022. So it's a while off yet. So hopefully all of this crazy pandemic will be will be over with by then. We'll be able to all go and enjoy an amazing event um, held by the SCS in London. And you can register your interest there um, at their website as well. So thank you very much for listening today. As I said, I've said it about a million times, I know, but I will be sending the recording um, and you can feel free to ask me any questions. There's some general contact information there for you um, for our company. So we've got Support Aid and Research as our, as our kind of main inbox. Uh, our website and our LinkedIn page there as well. Um, we've been running these webinars weekly. I'm sure some of you have been joining those um, and you can follow us at our company page to see more information on those. And as a call to action, as I keep putting out there as well, if there's any topics that you feel like we haven't covered um, and that you're really interested in, that anything to do with advertising, anything to do with um, claim substantiation or consumer testing, um, or any kind of regulation um, within the cosmetics industry or other industries, um, please let me know and we can put together a fantastic webinar for you, which will go through all of that. I've got some really exciting things coming up, in particular um, a panel that we'll be doing with some experts in the CBD industry. Um, so yes, watch this space, follow us on LinkedIn and um, yeah, we'll um, hopefully see you all soon. Thank you very much.